today the uh, theme for the Sunday afternoon talk is uh, the blue pill or the red pill. Why wake up when my habits are so pleasant? The image of the blue pill or the red pill this comes from the the science fiction film The Matrix. And in the story, uh, all humanity is living in a uh, group delusion, comfortable, orderly, repetitive, but a deluded illusion of existence. If they take the, if the hero takes the, the blue pill, then that orderly, repetitive, comfortable delusion continues. If they take the, the red pill, then they wake up from the delusion. And uh, what they find is that in actuality, humanity uh, each human being is kept in a little flotation tank, a pod, trapped, wired up with cables, and the great machine of artificial intelligence is running on their mental energy, their life energy, as a power source. So do we want to maintain the delusion? Or do we want to wake up? Of course, one doesn't know what one will find when one wakes up. In the film, it's a nasty surprise. The uh, <clears throat> When the hero chooses the red pill and discovers themselves to be in a, a little tank wired up with cables, and uh, makes the escape into the grim reality of, of life under the governance of these uh, computers and artificial intelligence. The mentor, the guide, greets the, the hero to the experience of life outside the tank with the words, Welcome to the desert of the real. Welcome to the desert of the real. So why would we want to wake up if our habits are so pleasant? Why not stay in our tank with our, our mind fogged by the program? Happily carrying on our repetitive, deluded, Comfortable habits. Why well, wake up when our, if our habits are so pleasant? Well, the Buddha is the one who offers us the red pill. We can consider for our, ourselves why we might want to wake up, or why we w might want to stay deluded. We can try very hard to live within the little bubble of our delusions. My personality, my story, my loves, my hates, my opinions. But then Buddha's great kindness, his great compassion is to help us wake up because it's not real. That's not what the truth is. The perceptions of self-view, my body, my mind, my story, my loves, my hates, my successes, my failures, it's not true. It's just the, the uh, effect of the blue pill. This is avijja. Ignorance is what sustains those delusions. And 
out of habit. Much of our life as a human being is spent keeping a blue pill uh, supply consumption and uh, keeping it steady. And we distract ourselves with uh, intoxicants, drugs and alcohol. We create uh, busyness. We take refuge in our opinions take a refuge in reason, or we're just trying to snooze through life. How many of us have uh, been lying in bed and kind of waking up, but kind of preferring to be in the dream state, wanting the dream to continue, not wanting to have to get up, hoping that the, the snooze will carry on, hoping that the dream will continue. But something in the back of the mind recognizes, got to get up, time to get up. Because the dream world is not real. It's called a rude awakening. Waking up to rude reality, raw and challenging. The desert of the real. And I think it's more pleasant, more kind to let beings uh, carry on in their little pod, a um, little bubble of self, uh, self-concern, self-assurance, our own little program. But the Buddha's great kindness is to help us to wake up. I was trying to sustain a delusion is like sustaining a lie. If you've told a lie and you're trying to maintain it, it's really hard work. Remember what you said to who? Keep the lie going. Truth is self-sustaining. Reality, the Dhamma, is self-sustaining. So the Buddha helps us to, to wake up to break out of the pod. And even though that breaking out of the pod, our own judgments, our our sense of identity, our sense of purpose and meaning, time, personality, letting go of that can feel like a desert experience. It's a kindness to wake up to that. When I was a teenager, I used to feel jealous of the friends I had who seemed to be able to just blot out all considerations and just uh, immerse themselves in their own particular concerns, their own busyness, their own interests. I used to feel quite jealous that my mind kept thinking about stuff, kept going outside the box and asking, why is this important? Why do we do this? What's so special about this particular kind of clothing or that particular music or this particular activity? Why why is it such a big deal? Why are we doing this? And then the friends would give me that kind of look like, you're crazy, have another drink, (laughs) get another round in. Stop thinking so much. And of course, I would often speak of the image in the journey to the East, Hermann Hesse's novel about a spiritual journey where the hero in that book is crossing the desert of Morbio Inferiore, the valley of despair. And the hero thinks that all the others have lost their way and that the wise thing to do is to turn back because the journey is a delusion. So the hero turns back in the desert and busies themselves with their their everyday concerns. And only 30, 40 years later, they realize that that they were the ones who got it wrong and that if they carried on through the desert, 
there was a great joy, great freedom, liberation on the other side. They were the ones who made the mistake in being put off by the desert, turning back. So the Buddha encourages us to wake up. We have these reflections, the five subjects for frequent recollection. I am of the nature to age, I am of the nature to sicken, I am of the nature to die. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. I am the owner of my karma, related to my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, abide supported by my karma, whatever karma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. Often when these teachings were presented, people feel that's really depressing. Or, was the Buddha a sadist? Did he want us to be miserable and sad and lonely? No, it's the great compassion. The Buddha helping us to recognize that sad sadness, loneliness, loss, these are part of the natural order. There's nothing to be afraid of. No thing to be lost. So only when we're trying to sustain the bubble of delusion that I possess youth, I possess vigor, I possess my faculties, I possess my friends, I possess my wealth, my reputation, my things. I'm the owner. These are mine. It's a fearful state. Got to keep all that, protect it all. And when there are signs that it's eroding or changing, something challenges it, we feel defensive, fearful, threatened. But out of great compassion, the Buddha says, No, look, look. This life is part of a natural order. Aging is part of it. Sickness is part of it. Change, gaining and losing is part of it. How could it not be? If there's birth, there has to be death. If there's coming together, there has to be separation. Of course. How could it not be so? So, when we cross the desert of the real, it's challenging to the self-view, to the ego, threatening. What about my stuff? What about my things? What about who I am? It's threatening to self-view, but it's freeing to the heart. Entering the unknown, opening the heart to the unknown, threatens the habits of self-view, self-centered thinking. But if we pass through that, that valley of mobio inferiore, pass through that barrier, on the other side, there's a great relief. This life, this mind, this being, is part of nature. The mind is Dhamma. It's not a person. This body is Dhamma. It's part of the natural order. What could be lost? What could be gained? Who is there to own anything? This nature knowing itself. Dhamma aware of its own quality, its own presence. The Dhamma that is the awareness of this mind knows the Dhamma that is the flow of perceptions, thoughts, feelings, memories, ideas, moods. It's Dhamma aware of its own nature. This is what we are. A center of experience where Dhamma knows itself. That's all. No more, no less. And in that, there's total security. Freedom. Peacefulness. It's by turning towards what's apparently threatening or challenging 
that we discover that there is nothing to be afraid of. Who is there to be hurt? Who is there, who is there to lose anything? There's a huge relief, a great relaxation of the heart. As long as there's possessiveness, if we own other people in our perceptions, I belong to you, you belong to me, then there's threat, there's fear of losing. If loving kindness, compassion are based on a liberative attitude, an attitude of non-possession, non-owning, not self. And there's metta, karuna, in great abundance. Great love, compassion for other beings, mudita for their blessings and benefit. But when the other being is not around, we don't miss them. We don't need others in order to make us complete. The heart is complete and self-sustaining, as it is. How could it not be? The Dhamma is not missing anything. How could it be? So the red pill, even though it might have a bitter taste, entering the desert, what comes with it is great freedom. The Buddha was greatly compassionate, understanding, encouraging us to, to uh, wake up, to challenge those habits of shutting down, wanting to, to doze through life, wanting to, to switch off. When I lived in California, there was a popular bumper sticker which said, I've given up my search for truth and I'm now looking for a good fantasy. Something in us resonates with that. If I didn't have to deal with all this reality, if I could just switch off and live in my own little bubble, that would be so great. But it's important to recognize that urge but to see that's a fearful, self-centered urge. An impulse that's only going to cause more suffering in the long run. We listen to that, know that, and choose to go against it. No, time to wake up. Then there's a feeling of loss. Oh, I was enjoying that dream. But then there's also the great freshness, the great freedom of being awake. Here's the reality. Ah. Perhaps more challenging, but it's real. It has the taste of reality and the taste of freedom, fearlessness, reliability, true security. <laughs> 